It was early morning on July 16, 1945, at the Alamogordo Proving Grounds near White Sands, New Mexico. A select group of atomic scientists and U.S. military personnel had gathered. On a tower in the distance was a secret, untested nuclear device codenamed Trinity. The countdown began, and then the button was pushed. In a flash of light, the nuclear age came bursting on the scene. America had won the race to unleash the destructive power of the atom. It was clear this power was awesome, too awesome to remain untamed. So began the quest of science to harness that power for peace, while others feared it would lead to another war more destructive than any since the beginning of time. The beginning of time. The beginning of time for man? The beginning of time for the universe? How did it all begin? What keeps the awesome power of the atom in check until it bursts forth in those uncontrolled nuclear reactions? Scientists have deciphered the laws that govern them, but who made the laws? Who made the atoms? And who made the Earth, sun, moon, and stars? Hi, I'm Don McIntosh, and in this program, we'll be exploring the scientific mysteries of the universe and the controversy over how it came to be. But first, on Christmas Eve in 1968, the Apollo 8 astronauts Anders, Lovell, and Borman gave an impressive answer to the question of who made the heavens and the Earth when they relayed a special message back to Earth from their orbit around the moon. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the Earth. And the Earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the white day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. And let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament. And divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together into one place. And let the dry land appear. And it was so. And God called the dry land earth. And the gathering together of the waters called the sea. And God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. The world was stunned. Like a voice from the heavens, it was reminded of the Creator's claim in Genesis that He had done it all in six days. But most modern scientists long ago rejected the six literal days of creation in favor of Big Bang's theory of geologic and cosmic evolution over six long geologic and cosmic periods. They claim it's one of science's greatest achievements of all time. But two U.S. scientists, Dr. Robert Gentry and his son and associate, Dr. David Gentry, now prepare to show why it's actually scientists' greatest blunder, not its greatest achievement. In particular, instead of the universe being the same everywhere, which is Big Bang's key assumption, they have discovered astronomical proof the universe has a nearby center. They believe this startling discovery may yet attract the interest of people of all religious persuasions and even those who have none, for they believe it points to the great white throne, the celestial dwelling place of the God of Genesis, the same God who gave the literal seven-day creation commandment to Moses on Mount Sinai. With this background, Drs. Robert and David Gentry begin to unfold the exciting saga behind their discoveries. The excitement really begins by recognizing that the Hubble Space Telescope and other NASA telescopes have photographed some truly amazing celestial objects within our universe. This is a very long exposure of our galaxy as seen in the night sky. We see it here from inside, looking edge on, through its disks, 
of billions of stars interlaced with vast clouds of dust and gas, hundreds of thousands of light years in size. And this is a supernova, exhibiting what astronomers have called the glowing eye. Then we have NGC 49's cosmic blast. And then the ant, a planetary nebula surrounding the dying sun-like star Menzel 3. Another exploding star caused the Eskimo Nebula. It's about 5,000 light years from Earth in the constellation Gemini. A complex of mixed nebulosity surrounding the triple star Rho Ephiuchus and the yellow giant Antares. And here's the amazing NGC 346 in the small Magellanic Cloud. Another exploding star, 3,000 light years away in the constellation Draco, created the Cat's Eye Nebula. B838 Monoceratus is from a burst of light traveling outward and illuminating shells of gas and dust ejected from the central star and has been likened to Van Gogh's Starry Night. And here are the fabulously exotic pillars of creation in the Eagle Nebula. They're actually spires of rarefied gas and dust hundreds of light years long. And here's a close-up of the beautiful Orion Nebula that we'll see more of later on. These two closely spaced galaxies, nicknamed the mice, are 300 million light years away in the constellation Coma Berenices. The variety of shapes and the sizes of galaxies is unbelievable. Take, for example, the barred spiral NGC 1300. And then the starburst galaxy. Here we have Hoag's Object Strange Ring Galaxy. And here is the Antenna Galaxy, showing the interaction of two spiral galaxies. Galaxies are so huge, and their distances so great, that we can hardly comprehend their existence. The beauty and majesty of all these celestial wonders captures the imagination. Take a look at the exquisite detail of these astronomically huge lanes of gas and dust that form a belt around the Sombrero Galaxy. Surely all these galaxies are telling us something of vast importance. To see what it is, we turn to this special Hubble Space Telescope photo that took 11 days or 1 million seconds to expose in 2003 as the telescope orbited the Earth. It shows several thousand galaxies in a little speck of space the size of a pinhead. It's aptly named the Hubble Ultra Deep Field because it recorded galaxies more distant than any ever seen before and leads to the estimate that throughout the cosmos there are over several hundred billion galaxies, each with over a hundred billion stars. Many small green circles have now been drawn on this image, each one containing the most distant galaxies ever seen. But when magnified, we see that all of them are red. Why? These distant galaxies must reach almost to the edge of the visible universe. And because we see about the same density of galaxies in every direction the telescope is pointed, we say this is evidence that our universe does have a center, which is astronomically nearby. But this is just the opposite of what Hubble and other astronomers concluded when interpreting his famous redshift discovery. So which is correct? To find the answer, we flash back in time to the early part of the 20th century. By then, astronomers like Edwin Hubble knew that the Doppler effect could cause spectral line shifts due to the relative motion of the source and observer. Here's a real astronomical illustration of the Doppler effect. The gases swirling around a distant galactic disk that are moving toward Earth produce a blue shift. Those moving away produce a red shift. It was at Mount Wilson Observatory in the 1920s that Hubble utilized its new 100-inch reflector, the largest telescope of that day, to discover that light arriving from distant galaxies was redshifted in an orderly way. In 1929, he published his findings. The greater the redshift, the greater the distance a galaxy was from the Earth. This was a monumental discovery that modern astronomy has confirmed. It was also very puzzling. Hubble and other astronomers had observed redshifts of different galaxies, but didn't recognize the systematic trends. Previously, the universe was thought to be static and unchanging. 
Now it was shown to have an unexpected kind of order. Why then didn't Hubble report this discovery over 75 years ago? The answer is in his 1937 book, The Observational Approach to Cosmology. On page 51, he stated, The unwelcome supposition of a favored location must be avoided at all costs. And on page 54, he emphasized, There must be no favored location in the universe, no center, no boundary. All must see the universe alike.